Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, Jeremy Siegel, professor. Um, I am so pleased to meet you. This is the first time that we're having a one-on-one. Both of us have been in the news quite a bit uh, for the same reason recently. Um, but before we go into that, uh, Professor Siegel, would you uh, mind giving us a, a sense of your background? I have your bio here, but I always love to hear the emphasis on certain parts of the career that a person takes us through so that we can dwell on it a little bit. Yeah, and that's a very nice question. I, I did my undergraduate work at Columbia. I'm actually from the Midwest, from Chicago, but when he did uh, undergraduate Columbia math and, and economics, um, I didn't take it to my junior year, but I, I discovered I loved it. I went, got my PhD in economics at MIT, not in finance, uh, where I specialized in monetary theory and policy. My first teaching position was at the University of Chicago. I was very honored to be a colleague of Professor Milton Friedman. Got to know him very well um, and remained friendly with him after uh, he retired. It was my first teaching position. He was the uh, first four years, and it was his last four years. And then I got an wa- offer from Wharton and was there for 45 years in finance. Um, I taught macroeconomics, but I, got, I was always interested in the stock market, and I wanted to meld the concepts of macro with uh, what what is the fundamentals of the valuation of the stock market? I was there 45 years. I retired a year ago, July, from active uh, teaching at uh, Wharton. Um, so I, I still do a few uh, exec ed programs, but mostly um, write and, uh, and and lecture. You're probably busier now than you've ever been, judging from what I see. Um, You know, we have something in common. My father wanted me to take economics, and I, therefore, avoided it when I first got into college. And uh, uh, during my second semester at UCLA, actually, I took a course, and I loved it, trying to figure out the way the world works and... uh, I just found it fascinating. And in in the early part of my career, of course, uh, Chairman Volcker uh, definitely was taking a leaf from uh, Milton Friedman's book and, uh, you know, really focused on uh, money supply. So love to get in into that a little bit. And then the third point you made, uh, finance and macro. You know, I moved into the business. I, uh, Art Laffer uh, was one of my mentors at USC. He was there at Chicago and I was, uh, he was a colleague of mine. And I got to know him quite well at Chicago when, when I went there in 1972. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, I thought so. Uh, so uh, I uh, got to know Art pretty well and uh, loved his classes. But when I got into the business in the early 80s, macroeconomics was the only thing that mattered, a little bit like now. Um, and uh, the Laffer theory was uh, being tested, uh, you know, cut taxes and you won't have a deficit. And of course, uh, we were in a recession, so that kind of interrupted uh, that point of view for a time. But then what happened in our business is macro became uh, sort of a bad, bad thing. And uh, we we moved into a just study company by company and you can build up what the macros are. And now we're back to macro seem to be the only only thing that matter. So I'd like to take you uh, through your journey a bit. Well, first of all, as you reflect on monetarist theory, 
um, and have watched it in practice uh, work, maybe not work. Just what are your thoughts about that? And especially now that we're really down to 0% money growth on a year over year basis, practically. Negative. Even worse, Kathy, than, than zero. <laughs> um, it's really shocking. Um, as you know, you know, Milton Friedman emphasized the important concept of money was the M2, the total liquidity that people had, bank accounts, savings, checking, money market, mutual funds, CDs, all that. And the money supply increase that we had in 2020 was the greatest in 150 years. And that just blew my mind. And I knew there was going to be, infl- by the summer of 2020, I knew there was going to be a lot of inflation. And I know that all that talk by uh, Chairman Powell about, uh, you know, that this was transient and all that was just nonsense. And I was one of the earliest to predict it. And then suddenly in 20. 20- 22, by March, from March until now, we've had a decrease in the money supply. And I went back to the monthly data. And since World War II, we have never had a decrease in the money supply. So they went from super accommodative to ultra tight. It's like going 150 miles an hour in a 75 mile zone and then slamming on the brakes uh, as hard as you can. And, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I think there was, ter- there's been terrible mistakes both ways. Yeah, I was just want, want to pick up on that a little bit. You know, what, what I've been saying, and I'd just love to get your uh, point of view on this. If you look at what Chairman uh, Volcker did in the early 80s, you know, inflation really uh, it got its start in the Vietnam War and Great Society in the 60s and going off the gold exchange standard in 1971, OPEC, and then, you know, all, all hell breaks loose. So that was the problem that Chairman Volcker had. And what he did is he raised interest rates. He doubled interest rates from 10 percent to 20 percent. Um, now, I look at what what this uh, Fed has done, and they had, by the time they recognized it, a 15-month problem, not a 15-year problem. And they have taken interest rates up 16-fold, not two-fold, 16-fold. And many people dismiss that out there. It's, oh, well, the base was so low. And that's the whole point. You know, you got expectations after 10 years post 08, 09, low interest rates for for a long period of time and then boom what do you think the the ramifications are going to be now uh i think you believe we're in a recession or or close to so i think inflationary expectations uh, powell was right never became unanchored while they did during the vocal period and that w- required that increase all the way up to 20%. Secondly, uh, we are in secular decline of real interest rates. Over the last 20 years, real interest rates around the world ha- have declined. I mean, it, it's almost hard to, to believe, but the 10 year tips yield in 2000 was nearly 4.5% positive. And it steadily has gone down. And I've looked at tips yields around the world, they've all gone down. Uh, which means that, you know, uh, you're, you're perfectly right. You, we don't have to raise people talk about, uh, you know, raising them three, four, five percent above year over year inflation. That's not necessary. The whole structure of interest rates is lower. So this is a violent increase in real rates. Don't forget the tips rate started this year at minus one and a half percent and shot up to over one and a half percent. I mean, a 3% increase in real yields, and you add a risk premium on, on stocks to that, you know, that, that'll that depress, even, even, even if cash flows go up, that will depress prices. <laughs> and of course, as you say, the longer the duration has it, the more it will be depressed. It's a violent increase in real rates. Um, very truthfully, I think the equilibrium tips rate is about zero on 10 year. And I actually think um, the nominal 
Fed funds rate in a 2% inflation world is something like 1.5%. I actually believe slightly negative real rates on the short end. So, you know, moving it up as they're talking about, um, you know, into the fours or, or even five rates is way, way above uh, equilibrium. And when we have just overwhelming evidence that the prices of every sensitive commodity, real estates, cargo rate, shipment rates, oil, other sensitive commodities uh, have all gone down. This idea that we we haven't made uh, sufficient progress against inflation is incredulous to me. Yeah, one of the prices that uh, that I've focused on, and and I'm wondering back in the day if Greenspan really tied monetary policy to it, it was the gold price, which was it was in a range for two years, peaked in August of 20, returned to test that earlier this year, and now has broken below this. 17, well, I guess it's right at the low end of the 1700 to nearly 2100. And looking at copper breaking below the four to five range, just one commodity after another breaking down. So that's upstream, that's upstream in the pipeline, and that will move downstream into the PPI and CPI. But even downstream at the consumer level, we're beginning to see because overwhelming uh, inventories. 30, 50 percent discounts this holiday season, which surely are going to get into the price indices. I'm wondering, uh, there is a concept out there that uh, you will probably have a point of view, you most certainly will have a point of view on. Uh, it's a little esoteric, but the velocity of money, my experience uh, just watching it, it, it over these last 40 years is that it tends to go up when uh, people expect inflation. Uh, and this time around, it has be, it's been stable for the last two years, having been in a decline since uh, 1997, really, in a trend sense. I put together this negative money growth, and uh, now people seeing discounts and saying, well, I don't have to buy now because prices aren't going up, they're going down. How serious do you think this recession will be in the next year or so? I believe that if the Fed continues to raise, and of course, uh, you know, we have a, we've had a, a yesterday a minor pivot there with a welcome pivot. I mean, it, it's sort of the truth is getting slowly through this idea of not going 75 in, uh, in two weeks and, and going... 50. But I was very disturbed. You, you know, he said, like, we're not done and we're going to continue to raise in uh, 2023. Not necessary, in my opinion. My, my feeling is they don't even need this 50. But OK, we're what's thankful it's not 75 and we're going 50. My feeling is they should just stop and watch, because I, I think if they watch what's going to be happening in the economy, we're going to have start lowering rates. I, I, I actually said uh, a month ago on the networks, kind of shocking people, we may see a two-handle on the Fed funds rate by the end of next year, not uh, you know, a four to five handle the way uh, Fed, uh, the way Fed Ch- uh, Powell talks. I really think we're going to see the slowdown and in, in prices. As you say, all the sensitive commodity prices, the copper prices, real estate prices, really critical, are going down. I actually think real estate prices are going to go down 10, 10 to 15 percent, not as much as they went up. Uh, we're still going to be higher than pre-pandemic. But that's a real important part. As you know, uh, housing is 40 percent of the core consumer price index. And uh, so it's, it's in a downtrend, a strong downtrend right now. And so they can't ignore that. Uh, you're right about discounts. Uh, we, we had uh, uh, wholesale inventories, retail inventories that firms are clearing out. I think this quarter, I know the Atlanta now GDP now thinks it's 4%. I don't think it's going to be 4%. I mean, it's closer to 2%. And GDP this whole year is almost near zero. And if the Fed stays at, uh, at stay, keeps that Fed funds rate in the upper fours or five, absolutely guarantees a recession, in my feeling, uh, in 2023 and 2024. If they pivot and see all this 
we still have a chance for uh, people call it a soft landing. That's sort of a code for saying, you know, maybe not a severe recession. Don't forget the first two quarters of this year, we had ne- negative GDP, which in a, in a certain technical, narrow technical term was a recession already. So it's, it's kind of weird. Are we going to get a double recession? There's some un- very unusual things, Kathy. We added four and a half million workers to the labor force this year, and we had virtually no growth in GDP. That's unprecedented. There was a collapse of productivity in the first two quarters of this year that we have never seen before, nor has Fed uh, Powell uh, or the Fed ever tried to explain it, which I think is critical if you're going to actually implement monetary policy. Uh, So uh, if we get a productivity bounce back and these workers produce rather than not, I mean, what what, what were they doing? Uh, We could put downward pressure further on prices, an upward movement of productivity, which would be good actually for stock prices and profit margins. Oh, it'd be spectacular. Uh, One of the, uh, as far as labor, one of the reasons perhaps that uh, we've been surprised on on employment here is during COVID, it was so difficult to get workers and even afterwards, so difficult to get them that just like with inventories, they, they double and triple ordered so they would be sure to have the inventory, now they have too much. I think they kept on labor, even though at the margin, uh, the profitability is suffering uh, because it took so long to get that labor. So I just wonder if there will be a disgorgement actually more rapid uh, in the next year as companies say, oh, my, my margins are getting destroyed. Uh, so so that, that would compound uh, the the recession that you're talking about, right? Kathy, I think you're spot on uh, on this. Uh, and I've been talking about it because of the great difficulty right after the pandemic, firms overhired. And then workers uh, often didn't produce, but then they challenged their bosses, well, fire me, think you, you can't get anyone else. <laughs> so they kept them on. Uh, but as soon as firms begin to see, you know what, I do have some choices out there. There could be a big disgorgement. And we could really we could really see, you know, labor growth negative. In other words, payroll declines uh, next year. Now, the interesting thing is that as this year, we had enormous growth, four and a half million more workers, but almost zero GDP. Next year, we might actually have a loss of workers, but maybe some growth in GDP because they're getting rid of workers that really haven't been doing much with very low productivity. You know, we've heard about this quiet quitting syndrome, this idea, and it's related to, you know, uh, you know, you, you can't fire me because you can't get another worker. So hold on. But that, you know, that that I don't think that's going to cut it in the long run. And firms, once they see, you know, I can't get someone that's going to produce I can get rid of all these people. And uh, we could see a, a little bit of a flip side of this very unusual situation in, in 2022, which was, as I say, big labor market growth on numbers, very poor GDP. We could see poor labor market growth, but maybe better GDP by keeping the more productive people. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, interesting. As we went through COVID, one of the things, uh, one of the, our mantras was innovation solves problems. Um, as, as you may know, uh, our focus is exclusively on disruptive innovation in terms of, uh, in terms of invest, research and investing. And certainly innovation helped get us out of COVID, sequencing the virus, getting tests, getting a vaccine and so forth, digitalizing the world, digitalizing our lives and so forth. This labor conundrum that, that uh, companies were facing and now their margin, uh, the, the, the hit to their margins as the productivity uh, suffers is a call for more innovation, more automation. and. And we're seeing breakthroughs in artificial intelligence that even we are surprised to see the progress, uh, you know, we're, we're, even in terms of programming. Uh, programmers now can use Copilot, an AI helper, and actually, before they start, have 30% of a program written. So that's a huge increase in productivity. So I think that what you just said about companies having to address 
their margins effectively uh, as productivity goes down is going to cause another boom in innovation as automation with industrial robots and autonomous mobility um, evolves here. Uh, I think we're at the dawn of a major increase in productivity if policymakers don't get in the way. <laughs> Does that ring true to you at all? Well, you know, it has shocked me, uh, you know, as I, as I noted, first two quarters of this year, the fall in productivity was the greatest in any two quarters since World War II. And I, it just shocked me. I mean, I, I mean, and look what we're doing. You're talking about innovation. You know, we're, we're, we're going through, uh, you know, a Zoom type of meetings that, uh, although they, they were technically pro- possible before COVID, they, people weren't implementing them. I mean, I've been able to do so much more. You know, at first, all conferences went online. I was very effective with those online conferences, and now I can do so many of them. It's been a tremendous boost in productivity. You don't have to fly people in. I mean, we, you know this. You know, you're, you're, you're the expert on this. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I had thought that the whole Internet was going to spark a boom in productivity because of the fact that it, it could it enables people to share knowledge so easily and, and communicate. I mean, it's true that Zoom is not as good as really being in the room, but it's a lot better than a telephone. <laughs> and it, I mean, it, it does allow for collaboration. It does allow for looking at body at language when you make a suggestion. How is the other person reacting? I mean, there, there's so much more than just the words that people use in terms of uh, re- responding to new knowledge. I think that productivity is going to bounce back. The lost productivity had, again, something uh, to do with overhiring uh, workers be- believing to say, dare, dare me to, you know, to fire me. Th- this idea, you know, work from home. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm putting, I'm, I say I put in eight hours, I'm putting in five hours, but you can't really fire me. I, I think a lot of that is going to turn around. And um, because firms are going to see that they have alternatives um, and uh, they can get other workers. And that's why I'm not as pessimistic about the profit picture or even, you know, negative GDP growth. Again, we could just see a reverse of 2023 or 2022, big labor growth, no, virtually no GDP. We could have negative labor growth. (laughs) In 23, and GDP could surprise us by being up 2 and 3% because of the burst of productivity. Yeah, so I'd love to, in terms of thinking about the period we're in, I know that most economic statistics or the, the, the best economic statistics, highest quality, are post-World War II. But uh, we've gone back earlier uh, and taken a look at uh, inflation, interest rates during two other periods, and I'd love to get your point of view on which one of these is more right, because there are echoes of both of these periods now. The negative one is uh, 1929, uh, when the Fed was tightening. Uh, Inflation wasn't a problem. They just wanted to squash uh, financial speculation. So there's there's somewhat of a similarity there, but maybe uh, Smoot Hawley was what really many people, many economists think, really tipped uh, tipped us into the depression. So tariffs and protectionism, and the echo of that might be the Chips Act. We know it's for national security reason, but chips go into everything, uh, and I know this is just at the high end, and so I just want to. While we don't think this is the higher probability, I'd just like to get your point of view, given you are a student of economic history. Yeah, I thought Smoot Howley certainly was was terrible. I think tariffs are terrible. You know, my, my biggest gripe with Trump's economic policy was always on tariffs. I remember, I, I you know, I got a call from Ron Priebus after tr- Trump became president and he said, Jer- Jeremy, do you want to, uh, we, we invite you to be uh, head of the of uh, the Council of Economic Advisors, which is a prestigious position. But that position requires you to support the president's proposal. It's very different than the Fed, where you have supposed independence and you can't speak out against the president. 
And so I declined it because I was really against Trump's tariff policy. I do think as I look back, and again, um, because of my studies with Milton Friedman, that the principal cause of the Great Depression was the failure of the Fed to prevent the total collapse of the banking system. And the money supply decreased by 30% from 1929, 1933. The Fed stood by and let anything collapse. They shrugged their shoulders, said, you made bad loans, you should all collapse. And of course, common people lost all their savings. There was no Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to stand uh, uh, that. And it 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 just drove everyone into poverty of it caused 30% deflation is something that's unimaginable. I mean, we're talking about getting inflation down to 2%. It was 30% deflation. Now, Smoot-Hawley on top of that certainly didn't help. I I think it hurt. But I would put the Fed's failure to prevent the collapse of the banking system. Remember, the Fed was formed because J.P. Morgan in the panic of 1909 kind of single-handedly saved the banking system by lending. And uh, the government said, listen, we don't, we don't want a private bank there to, you know, to be the one that saves the U.S. So let's form a central bank for that purpose. And they failed. They, they totally failed on that, on that first step, which is just inconceivable. I mean, that was when Friedman won the Nobel Prize, um, in 1976 for his book, Monetary History of the United States, and, and the chapter in there called The Great Contraction, which is so uh, so damning on their policy. It's just so crystal clear when you look at the data, what happened. Now, you're absolutely right. Those tariffs on top of that was just, you know, adding fuel to the fire of, of, the, of the terrible policies that were pursued during that period. And the tariffs are a negative policy. I don't know enough, honestly, about that you know, I know certainly about the chips policy and I've read, you know, both ways. I have not formulated a, a strong opinion, um, but in general, encouraging world trade, encouraging globalization is still very positive. We have to prevent the stealing of intellectual, the intellectual theft that, that we know China has engaged in, but uh, I am worried about you know, just saying we can just shut off China. I mean, China's economy is as big, if not larger than ours, four times the population, potential for tremendous growth. Xi's policies are terrible. There's some sign that it's beginning to ease up on that. But globalization is still, in my opinion, something that is very positive. And I, I, I am worried when we talk about, uh, you know, getting into a cocoon state and, uh, oh, we can do it all ourselves. I mean, the, the world of economics is specialization. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, trade is, is it basically created, you know, the, the trade routes, you know, going back to uh, the Greek and, and Roman times were critical. The, you know, the Silk Road and, and uh, you know, trade was, was, was so important everywhere. And uh, you can't shut it off. Right. And as I recall, I mean, as I recall from my studies, Smoot Hawley, when it was first put in place, you know, there really wasn't too much of a reaction. I mean, news didn't travel very quickly back then. Uh, And so, you know, the combination of the Fed, as you say, and Smoot Hawley. uh, So echoes of that potentially, but then there are echoes of uh, another time as well. I'd love to get your view here. Um, uh, the the late 19 teens. So we had a pandemic, the Spanish flu. We had a war, World War One. Now both of those were much worse, I think, than uh, what we are going through now. But uh, there are echoes: the invasion of Ukraine, the coronavirus. But w- one of the things, in again, looking at the data back then. We saw that, and there were probably massive supply chain problems. Again, news didn't travel very quickly, but and and so inflation at its peak got to twenty four percent in June of nineteen twenty on a year over year basis. But by the next June, June of twenty one, it was minus fifteen percent. And I am wondering, and you know, I think we've been through a massive supply shock. 
And t actually two of them, the coronavirus was one that caused uh, uh, massive disruptions and the war in the Ukraine as well. And I wonder if we will be looking back at this as those are unwinding or diminishing in terms of their impact on the global economy. Uh, if we're not going to be in a similar situation, especially now that money growth has gone to zero and looks like it's going to go, well, you said it is negative. I, I think it will be negative when the official reports come out. Demand, demand deposits are already negative. I'm wondering if we'll be in more of that kind of an environment where inflation goes from this 8 to 10 percent, wherever whatever metric you're using, down to minus something. Is that possible? in your mind? Well, there's a big difference. Remember, Kathy, that we were on the gold standard back then. You no, know, it was Roosevelt that took us off. So eventually, that big inflation that we had post-war and speculation and, and disruptions and, and policy was reversed because the money supply was brought back down to the level of um, it, by the way, that was the third biggest money supply increase. The, the first biggest was COVID, and you're, you're right in causing the biggest yearly increase in M2 money supply was 2020. The second was 1943, World War II, and the, the other one I think was 1917 uh, in World War I. But we are obligated to bring that money back down because we were on the gold standard and we had to maintain the parity. So now the big difference today is we had a 40% increase in the money supply from March of 2020, the beginning of COVID, when it struck, until March of this year when it stopped dead and then started going down. I mean, it was like the biggest pivot I'd ever seen on that. Now, it's gone down very minor. We are not going to go down to the pre-COVID level. That would require unbelievable tightening by the Fed. I mean, we have to accept the inflation that, you know, again, when you hear about what the, the Fed says, it isn't we're going to bring back the price level of 2020. We just, we're, you know, we've had this bump of inflation. Now we want to get it back to 2%. But we're not talking about getting it back down. And um, I think that would be a terrible mistake um, because it was a very severe recession. And uh, but it was, again, on the gold standard. Today, well, no one would expect that. Uh, again, Volcker, we had that big inflation. We just brought it back down to 2%. We didn't undo the inflation of the 70s. Because once we broke the link with gold and you have, you know, a fiat money, you don't obligate it to bring that money supply back down. You can just say, uh-oh, I produced too much. Let's reset. Let's get it back to a 5% growth, which is what I think is consistent with a 2% inflation rate. That's what I think the Fed should do now. L you know, Lower the interest rate, get that money growth back to the... We had, Kathy, for 34 years from the mid-1980s until the year of the pandemic, we had five, five and a half percent money growth, very steady. And we had two percent, two and a half percent inflation. Uh, that's what we've got to get back to. Um, and to get back to that means you can't keep on having this money supply go down. That's just going to be way over tight. We have to ease up, get that back to the five percent growth. That will be get it back to two percent. Um, if there's a productivity burst, that, that's all the better. That will low, lower inflation um, uh, even more, but it'll be from the supply side. It won't be because we're just over tightening and killing the economy. So uh, when you say negative money growth, you're looking at it from March. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, from March to now, it is astonishing that it is happening in the absence of something like the gold standard, right? Yeah, it is. It's never happened before. I mean, we, we've never had this, this decline uh, again. I mean, we weren't, we're not obligated to get back to that standard. Remember back in the Civil War, we went off the gold standard temporarily to fight the war. And then we pledged to go back on it. And, you know, within 10 years, we redeemed all our gold, gold uh, what's called greenbacks, which were not backed by gold. We redeemed them at gold at the original uh, 
Uh, and it required a long period of deflation, but the gold standard reigned supreme back then. We're, you know, we're in a different world, so we don't have to go back to that, squeeze the economy down to death to get it back to some sort of uh, parity. And, and, and by the way, even the most hawkish Fed members have never suggested we're going to get back to the price level level that we did. It's getting inflation back down and accepting well, they could have prevented it had they not burst it out so much. We could talk about that, but accepting what has already occurred in the pipeline. But they, you and I both believe they are making a mistake now, taking much money net down. So it wouldn't surprise me to see inflation go well below 2% because of this mistake, uh, especially, I mean, there could be a good and bad reasons for it. If you're right on productivity, Inflation certainly could go much lower than people are expecting right now, right? Yeah, let me tell you, Kathy. I um, I took I put the true housing numbers, not the faulty housing numbers the Fed uses, which is way lagged. Uh, and, and and there's been widespread discussion increasing. I mean, I've been bringing this up for two years. The way the Fed computes housing prices is way outdated and way lagged. Uh, they underestimated in, in the CPI housing inflation in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and, and now they're way overestimating it because, again, they're lagging and they're, they're bringing in increases that occurred a year ago. But my point is, I put the, the Case Shiller, uh, the apartment list, the Zillow, the, the current rent, current house price indexes, not the faulty uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics indexes in, and do you know that core inflation over the la- core, which is what Jay Powell quotes so very frequently, core inflation has been negative over the last two months, instead of this, you know, positive because of the lag housing data that they use, it's actually been negative. So in some sense, we are already in a negative inflation a mode already. Yes. And uh, one other thing I uh, just want to mention before we leave history, uh, and that is in the 19 teens, we were in a period of innovation like we had never seen before, telephone, electricity, and automobile. And one of the reasons I started ARC is because I believe we're in a, a, a actually more profound period of innovation with, you know, the genomic revolution, robotics, uh, energy storage, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology. And those are those periods of innovation are deflationary by nature because they're technologically enabled. So it's part and parcel of this productivity discussion. Uh, we think the productivity uplift uh, that will be caused by these five platforms is going to exceed that which we saw in the 19-teens by a significant amount. Uh, have you any thoughts about that or it's sort of just... Yeah, absolutely. Anything that increases productivity, uh, you know, is, is, is deflationary and increases real income. Listen, it is in, innovation is the only thing that increases standard of living. Uh, otherwise, we'd stagnate. As I said, I thought with the growth of the internet and the platforms you mentioned that, you know, have come in the collaboration, I thought there was going to be an acceleration of this innovation that would increase the productivity. Again, I think COVID has really thrown a wrench in it with the over hiring and all that, and we're getting faulty statistics. But if that begins to unwind, you know, it, there's a great potential of a burst of innovation in the next three to five years. Yeah, we believe that's going to happen. And especially now that con- the consensus of you in the world is productivity is dead and, uh, you know, inflation is here. You know, when, when the consensus view is moving in one direction and we see evidence that that is incorrect and that, uh, that, that the world is moving in the opposite direction, those are huge opportunities. And, you know, innovation, our, our strategies have been destroyed in the last two years because of inflation and interest rate fears, you know, that fears that they will extend well into the future. So, you know, I do think the rubber band is stretching here. Just one more question, uh, especially given the headlines recently. 
and that is on uh, crypto assets, crypto uh, currency. I'd love uh, to get your point of view and then just throw a little bit about our point of view um, uh, in the mix as well. You know, uh, I just published last month the sixth edition of Stocks for a Long Run, and I added crypto. I mean, I go with money, gold, the Fed, and cryptocurrencies. I took it from the point of view of a, a, an effect of money. I know blockchain is a very important aspect of crypto, but as a, as a point of view, money. And in it, I pointed out that our banking system, our whole payment system, Kathy, is crazy. I mean, merchants are charged 3% on Visa and Master Charge, and then they give me 2% back on my reward card. The government has estimated that costs consumers like 900, you know, uh, I think it was $200 billion a year of extra fees. We could make transfers so much more efficient. And overseas transfers are crazy. You know, Western Union migrants trying to get their money back. So, I mean, I think a lot of you know, crypto is saying, you know, we don't need these foreign exchange fees. We can make that faster. I think it's got a long way to go. I mean, you know, you know, there's the negatives of the volatility. It's also the negatives of the, the, you know, the correlation hasn't been independent. I think that may change over time. Uh, I mean, the great part about Bitcoin is it is limited. It's not a fiat currency that could be pumped up the way we pumped it up in 2020, 21 to cause this inflation. So long run. It does have that characteristics, but I think the banking system can't rest on its laurels. I think Master Charge and Visa have a monopoly that should be broken, and I think we, our whole transfer system and payment system could be reformed. Yes, well, uh, I think the, the way we're looking at crypto broadly is it's three revolutions. It's a money revolution, uh, certainly store of value for Bitcoin, uh, important role of uh, money. It is a, a financial services re revolution, which is what you're re referencing, um, uh, partly. And then ultimately, it is a property rights revolution, digital property rights for the first time. Uh, now, that is the earliest. So um, we, we think it is, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you thought the internet was going to increase productivity dramatically. I think this is the missing piece in the internet. We, when the internet wa was evolving in the early days, well, certainly no one thought it, any commerce would take place. It was an information exchange, an information network. And so there was never a payment system integrated into it. This is putting the payment system, the payments infrastructure into place. And so we think we agree with you on, on uh, financial services. And I think it's also, it's like the internet was in the early 90s. It was like, we have no idea the kind of productivity it's going to unlock or the kinds of new products and services it's going to, uh, it's going to unlock. So I'm really happy to hear you talk about that. We try and explain what's going on with FTX as pure fraud. <laughs> and that's not what this revolution is all about. Um, I, my, my guess is you, you would agree with that. Yeah, I mean, any totally new structure is going to go through growing pains. I'm not going to take a position on, on, on crypto. I'm not an expert on it. Um, I myself have never owned it. But, um, I mean, certainly blockchain, I mean, the, the idea that, yeah, I mean, you know, this, this idea that like records for real estate and everything, these title searches, which cost people thousands of dollars could, I mean, these, the, there, there's so many things that are crazy in our financial systems that are overcharged and that blockchain can be so much better and more efficient uh, at, uh, at, at producing that. I, I, I definitely see that. Uh, again, the role of crypto is money is still extremely early. There's a lot of issues there. I talked about some of those issues in my book as I compare crypto as money with gold, uh, bank deposits, fiat money that, that central banks had. So it's an early stage. But uh, uh, listen, there's no asset class in the world that is appreciated as much, you know, even with the decline recently as a Bitcoin, there's, there's, you can go back any part of the last 5,000 years. There's nothing that's appreciated as much. So just for that reason, it's something that has to be reckoned with. Yes. And um, 
we I, we actually did a, a paper on Bitcoin collaborating with Art Laffer. And as you know, Art's, uh, one of his mentors is Robert Mundell, or, uh, right? Who I knew also. He was at Chicago when I was there. Yeah, one of the great, greatest international theorists that we had. Yes, and he won a Nobel Prize for uh, his monetary theory. And uh, so Art did collaborate with us in 2015. And when I... When we he tore our paper apart from a, an economic theory point of view, and uh, then we put it out in collaboration with him. The question was, could theoretically could Bitcoin serve the three roles of money? And theoretically, the answer is yes. As you say, we're so early, but we were the first public asset manager to gain exposure to Bitcoin when it was two hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, today, at seventeen thousand dollars. It's very refreshing to hear you, uh, a, a student of economic history and an economic expert, be so open-minded about it. I think it's um, it's wonderful, and I think everyone should get your book. It's called uh, the 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 book that you're referring to, "Stocks for the Long Run." Stocks for the Long Run, sixth edition. Yeah, came out just last month. I think it's. Yeah, as they say, uh, added Bitcoin, five new chapters. It's by far the most extensive revision. First uh, first edition came out in, in 1994. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting overall conclusions, uh, you know, I, I studied all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century. Long run real returns on stocks were 6.7% a year in my first edition 30 years ago. And in the last 30 years, guess what the real return on stocks, even with this bear market, 6.7%. It's just quite remarkable, the, dur- the durability, despite the short-run volatility, the durability of, of, of equities has, has been absolutely remarkable. And um, I'm glad to share that and a lot of other knowledge that I that I accrued in my studies uh, with, with others. I guess I've you know, been a professor 49 years, and uh, I love to teach, and I love to explain. Well, I I, rec- I now I haven't read your latest edition. I am going to go look for it because especially because of Please do. I'll I'll I'll, fi- I'll send you a copy, Kathy. Oh, I, no, I'm going to go buy a copy. I'm going to support you uh, as I hope all of our our viewers do. So it's Stocks for the Long Run, 6th edition, uh Professor Jeremy Siegel. And is there any other way that um uh, people can access your uh, thinking. Certainly your book is probably the best way. Uh, uh, any other? Yes, we have a um, program on Sirius XM radio, a podcast, an actual radio program for an hour, Fridays at noon. I start out with a market commentary and then my assistant, Jeremy Schwartz, carries on with interviews of people. Sometimes I interview fed people for the whole hour. But a summary of my weekly commentary can be found on Wisdom Trees website, which is an ETF provider, as you as you know. I'm a senior advisor uh, to Wisdom Tree, and you can access their website, sign up, and get my market commentary, which is usually eight or ten minutes. And I try to put that out, uh, you know, every week. Wonderful. Well, um, I'm, I'm just delighted that we've had this time together, um, uh, walking through history and, and sharing uh, points of view. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. I, I've been delighted to spend this time uh, with you and look forward to reading your book. Thanks for, for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.